Today, more people are on the move than ever before. This is the moment these migrants have been waiting for. Since 2017, we've followed stories as they unfolded along one of the most notorious migration corridors, the route from South to North America. Buenos dias, buenos dias a todos. But this story isn't about the migrants themselves. It's about the industry that's emerged and keeps them on the move. Smugglers, cartels, shopkeepers, even humanitarians providing aid. A lot of people would look at you and say, you and these organizations are using these migrants as political tools or pawns. No. Who not only enable migration, but have come to depend on it. Siempre va a haber una manera que la gente pueda cruzar para allá. O sea, de una manera u otra ellos tienen que... La gente que trabaja en esto tiene que ver la manera de, pues, de trabajar. Son seres humanos, son nuestros hermanos. Nosotros los vemos como seres humanos. Para nosotros no son cifras. These are their stories. Yo he ayudado a muchas personas, mujeres, pues, en especial con niños. Por aquí hay muchos que han pasado y nunca han llegado. Se han caído. Se han caído y se han matado. Y por eso yo digo que siempre una persona por aquí necesita a alguien que lo guíe. Que lo, pero que lo guíe bien guiado. Porque solo le da duro. For those starting the journey from South America, the first major hurdle is the dense jungle and drug smuggling corridor between Colombia and Panama, known as the Darien Gap. We're heading deeper and deeper into the Darien Gap here on the Colombia side. We've still got a long ways to go. It's a lot of crisscrossing rivers. And we've got about seven more hours to go on foot. To survive the dangerous trek, 60 miles through unforgiving wilderness, migrants seek out locals who know the terrain, black market guides known as coyotes. Mi nombre es Emerson González Jiménez, o sea, campesino. Trabajo la minería también. Emerson says he charges each migrant about $700 to get them across the Panamanian border. Yo por lo menos, yo te cojo ese bolso tuyo y te lo acomodo y no queda así atorugado. Ese es tuyo. Venga, vacero, vacero, vacero. He's been supplementing his farming and mining wages in this way for nearly a decade with Agustin, his longtime partner in this underground trade. Con Emerson, nosotros nos conocemos desde muy niño. Hemos sido mineros. Hemos pasado unos ratos buenos, como también hemos pasado unos ratos malos. Bueno, somos bastante amigos, o sea, directamente unos compañeros como hermanos, directamente se puede decir. O sea, muchas personas piensan de que es malo, pero si yo. Yo para mí pienso que de una persona va, va a cargar, no puede. Y me dice, yo te voy a pagar 10 dólares, 5, 20, y me llevas a tal parte y yo no tengo trabajo. Para mí es bien. El tapón en Darien es duro, es difícil cruzarlo. Hay mucha loma, mucho río, hay muchas culebras, hay muchos tigres. Y ellos necesitaban ayuda de mí. Y yo conociendo el terreno, es imposible que yo lo iba a dejar morir. The migrants we met here, some from as far away as Bangladesh and Iran, say they've chosen this treacherous path because of rumors that if they make it out alive, Central American immigration officials will allow them passage northward. We're going to have to jettison as much weight as is humanly possible, taking only the very barest of essentials that we need to survive, food, first aid, and we're now starting to squabble over ounces here. Hey, 
no tengo el número exacto. Yo más o menos tengo un cálculo que pasé más o menos como mil y pico personas. O, o, o digamos casi los dos mil personas. O sea, es una cosa que tiene uno que tener demasiada paciencia. Paciencia, paciencia para lidiar con la gente. Africano tiene su lengua. Los de la India, los hindúes, o sea, cada quien tiene su idioma. Entonces, es muy duro a veces uno entenderle al otro. A veces uno dice sí, pero él dice no. A veces le dice uno, vente por aquí y entiende que se regrese. Es dura, pero con la paciencia se llega. Cosas de migrantes. ¿eh? Ropa, de todo. Donde campan, fogones, donde cocinan. Se pierde mucho. Se pierden de camino, unos cogen para otros, cogen por aquí. Y entonces ahí está el problema. La manzana que la mordió, ¿no? Porque por aquí es más fuerte que por la quebrada, porque por aquí tienen que subir duro por aquí. O sea que este, este camino en el verano es el camino de las mulas, las bestias, para subir hasta arriba. Cuando los mineros necesitan traer las la mercas, se suben por aquí. For Emerson and Augustine, this isn't simply an act of mercy. They're supplying a demand. And as long as wayward migrants arrive, there's a business opportunity to make money as a coyote. Directamente, a mí siempre me gusta el campo. Porque, como les digo, gracias a estos ríos panameños, he sobrevivido con mis hijos. Eso me la me ha dado yo. Con eso me he ganado para darle mi para darme casa. Por el tapón del Darien, gracias a este, a este tapón del Darien, siempre yo he sobrevivido. Aún la guardia me ha correteado, pero estable estoy por aquí. ¿Cómo se salió en inglés? Si alguno de mis hijos quisiera ir a Estados Unidos, pues yo me sentiría feliz. Fuera a estudiar o de ganar una beca o un deportista. Yo quisiera llegar también. Me parece que sería bueno. Pero que fuera de la forma legal. No quisiera que se tirara por aquí. Migrants who survive the Darien Gap have five more borders to cross before reaching the U.S. If they make it to southern Mexico, they'll find a haven of food and shelter that's become something of a legend. Bangladesh me llaman Jalama y ahorita los cubanos me dicen madrina. Los africanos me llaman mamá África. The traffic through this border town has surged in recent years. In February of 2019, crossings into the US reached an 11-year high, and many of those migrants stopped here on their way north. So this is like the main drag through town. So much of this town is built around migrant traffic. The street is just lined with hotel after hotel where people can rest their heads for a night or more and more often people are finding that their stays are becoming lengthier and lengthier. Due to the spike in arrivals here, Mexican immigration officials have been unable to keep up with the processing of cases. So some migrants wait weeks, sometimes months, before moving on to the next leg of their journey. Concepcion Gonzalez Ramirez runs this kitchen in the heart of this migrant transit point. Aquí es una cocina económica. 
un lugar económico. Nada más que se prepara comida de todos los países. How did you get the name Mama Africa? Porque ellos vieron la comida, la atención que yo les doy y ellos se sienten como en su casa, como si estuvieran en su casa. Ellos tienen la confianza como si yo fuera su, su propia mamá. Yo de por sí vendía comida, yo vendo comida porque yo soy madre soltera y para poder sacar a mis hijos adelante yo empecé a trabajar la comida. Some stop to work odd jobs to be able to buy extra supplies or pay additional coyotes for the journey ahead. Ay, Dios mío. Ella es una señora muy buena, muy fuerte, muy cariñosa y quiere mucho a la gente y a los emigrantes y ayuda a todo el mundo, cubanos, africanos, a todos. Yo la quiero mucho. ¿Y cuántos tiempos tú eres aquí? Llevo aquí 19 días. Ya me voy ya la próxima semana. ¿Dónde? Para México. Para cruzar. Espérame, mami. Amiga. Ah, ¿Qué pasó? Que cheque el hotel Catarina está enfrente, pero está lleno. Está full. Está full, mamá. Está full, papi. Porque aquí la mafia open the bag y take the coke, you know? Ok, no hay ¿Qué pasó? Quieren hotel, acaban, van llegando apenas. ¿Están llegando? Sí. ¿Dónde son? Eritrea. Del país de Eritrea. Migrants that arrive here are vulnerable to organized crime, scam artists, and human traffickers. It's a problem that's worsening with higher volumes of people in Tapachula. So you, you feel good knowing that you're able to help so many people? Pues sí, la verdad sí. La verdad sí, y le digo, todo es gracias a Dios que, que te da la bendición de que siendo una mujer, siendo madre soltera, siendo una mujer sin estudio, puedas apoyar a tantas personas de todo el mundo, porque aquí han venido de todos los países. Yo he podido apoyar a las demás personas. Tal vez no con dinero, pero con llevarlos al médico, con llevarlos a comprar su boleto de autobús o de avión, o con que ellos coman bien. Eso es, a mí me hace sentir bien. Thank you. The flow of migration has turned Tapachula into a boom town for hospitality. But in other places, a rush of migrants has created chaos and is straining resources. Este hecho lo que se nos vino. No hubo un lugar donde acomodarlos porque los albergues están llenos. ¿Dónde se meterían estas personas? Sí, nuestros hermanos migrantes. Buenos días, buenos días a todos. Buenos días. ¿Cómo están? Este, nomás venimos a avisarles que ya es la última llamada, que ya no hay ningún pretexto para estar aquí. El que se queda aquí va a ser bajo su propia Lord S. Lazardi has been working across Tijuana shelters for 25 years. She's a coordinator for the NGO Angels Without Borders, but is helping to manage this shelter as a volunteer. Ya mañana viene el gobierno a limpiar la calle. Allí hay lugar arriba para todos. 
¿Sería mejor que lo dejaran abierto toda la noche? No, no señor, por, por seguridad de las familias de ustedes, no puede estar cerrado, cerrado abierto toda la noche. ¿Y entonces para qué están los señores agentes? Cuidado. Está abierta la puerta para salir al baño y para los que van a trabajar, pero por seguridad de todos tiene que mantenerse cerrado. There are more than a dozen migrant camps and shelters like this in Tijuana, but space and resources for newcomers is getting harder to find. Most of the migrants here will attempt to seek asylum in the U.S., which is granted for those facing racial, religious, or political persecution. It's basically just a warehouse. It's been converted into makeshift shelters, about 50 tents downstairs, and probably now another, another 30 or so here. Many of these people have been here in, in Tijuana for the past three weeks, four weeks, kind of settling in for what appears to be a, a longer haul, certainly a lot longer than uh, people had anticipated. In 2008, a group of activists organized and guided a convoy of Central American migrants through Mexico to the U.S. in an effort to highlight the dangers they face. These so-called caravans ballooned in the years since, overwhelming U.S. border authorities and creating massive overcrowding at crossing points like Tijuana. Were you prepared for this many people to show up all at once? Nadie está preparado nunca. Nunca no estuvimos preparados. Todos los espacios de los albergues que se encuentran en Tijuana están con un 80% de migrantes nacionales. Este hecho lo que se nos vino de más de 6000 personas y nadie está preparado y menos aquí en Tijuana que es una frontera la más visitada, este por la cual casi todos se vienen por la seguridad. Hay grupos que Aprovechando de todo este movimiento, les pagan, son grupos de enfrentamiento que aprovechan y entran en estos grupos, se van mezclando para poder hacer su cometido de varios políticos. Do you think that the organizers of the caravan have created problems for you and other organizations here because there are too many people here now? Claro que sí. Nos causan bastantes problemas porque son bastantes líderes los que los traen. Ahí no sabemos sus intereses de ellos. Siempre hay terceras personas o otros intereses que no, este, no se están preocupando como ellos, como seres humanos. A los que siempre han traído las caravanas migrantes son este, pueblos sin fronteras. ¿sí? Que ellos son los que organizan estas caravanas, pero ahorita se les salió de control. ¿sí? So this is, it looks like kind of the marketplace here. Little shops popping up here, here and there. Yeah, yeah, they, uh, the, what, some of the migrants uh, have uh, started like a little shops where they sell little things. They came out, they had nothing. Irenio Mujica, a citizen of both Mexico and the U.S., claims responsibility for starting the migrant caravans. Have you seen anything like this no. before? Never, never, I've never seen anything like that. Not in Mexico, I never thought I'd seen it. I am an organizer of, uh, of a past caravan. This, this I didn't organize it. What, what is the caravan? What's the goal? The goal of the caravan, uh, a lot of the times, is, is visualize what the problem is. When we did last year, we, we were aware a lot of the separations of families, and we were trying to visualize a lot of it. This is the scene in Tijuana today. Earlier, hundreds in the caravan were peacefully protesting. That's when a small group broke off and rushed toward the fence. Do you think that the images of people storming the border, does that hurt you? Of course. Does that hurt your cause? We, do, we didn't want that. Uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't want these things to happen. This caravan hurt our cause big time.
Critics have accused activists like Arenio of using migrant caravans to create a media spectacle at the expense of the families and individuals seeking to safely reach the border. Many critics of, of President Trump will say that he is using these Central American migrants as a political tool or a political pawn to push his beliefs and his policies. A lot of people on, on the other side would look at you and say, you and these organizations are essentially using these migrants as political tools or pawns as well. How do you respond to that? No, we, we, don't, we don't try to use them. We, we are not thinking, we are not political people. We are seeing their poverty, we are seeing their need, and we address the needs. Have you been threatened? For what you do? <laughs> Believe me, I, I mean, I, I don't, sometimes, uh, a lot of times, I think I, you are becoming used to the threats everywhere. But oh, what's, what's the threat to you? To kill me, to hang me on the biggest bridge they have, to, to shoot me, that they're going to kill my family, that they're going to do this, that they're going to do that. I live in the United States. I care about my family. I care about the United States as well as I care in Mexico. I would not create this. You know how many years I have feeding people doing a little bit like this? Years. How many lives have I saved? Hundreds. And I literally have saved them because they are, if I wouldn't came two or three times, they would have that. The caravans have overwhelmed the border and the U.S. government has responded. According to Homeland Security officials, 240 migrants were returned to Mexico in the first months of 2019 as part of a pilot program to get asylum seekers to stay outside the U.S. while their claims are reviewed, a process that can take months, even years. Pero hay prioridades. Hay niños que no tienen algo, a ellos se les tiene que hacer llegar eso. El que quiera la ayuda, se la damos de corazón. Nosotros los vemos como seres humanos, como personas. Para nosotros no son cifras, ¿sí? Son seres humanos, son nuestros hermanos. Y eso queremos transmitir. For those who escape the limbo in Tijuana and make it to the other side, uncertainty remains as they enter a legal system already buckling under crippling backlogs. My niece used to say that my aunt is a truck driver because <laughs> Every time she calls, I'm driving either to the detention centers or going to interviews for the asylum office, and everything is far. <laughs> Natalie Gayumi is one of an estimated 2,000 immigration lawyers in California, home to one of the biggest immigration courts in the U.S. She handles asylum and deportation cases. So um, I can go ahead and call you later today at around 3.30. That way Natalie will be on the line and uh, she can explain what the next step would be for you. As of March 2019, the nationwide backlog of asylum and detention cases pending in U.S. immigration courts has swelled to over 800,000. Currently I have about 150 pending cases. I know people who have over 1,000. I do a lot of detained work. The cases are not quick, as a lot of people think. You come to the border and you seek asylum and you get asylum. It's not like that, you know. Is this a system that's susceptible to fraud? I don't believe so, but that's why there are there is that system. First, you have to screen and see if they do have a case. Then you look at whether they qualify for something else. You know, you have to figure out sometimes who has jurisdiction over your case, where can you file what. Not only is it a very long process, it's very complicated, and the standards are very difficult to meet. So a lot of cases don't even get approved because it's, the standards are very hard. Uh, you know, you're basically relying on testimony. When you think about the number of 
years that it may take. You think about the, the cost involved, sheltering, housing, and not to mention all the legal costs and administrative costs involved with a single person. What is our obligation as a country to footing the bill for all of that? I think especially if we focus on asylum, it's a humanitarian relief. You know, America has always been the greatest country in the world. That's why everybody thinks that America is safe. Everybody came here as, as immigrants, most of the people, you know, for religious freedom, for political freedom. And so that is what this country was based on. In the U.S., nearly eight out of every 10 asylum applications is denied. Sometimes I, when I'm driving, I listen to music and sing. Sometimes I listen to Iranian music. I was born and raised in Iran, came here at 16. So I understand when people come here and, you know, they don't speak the language, they don't know the laws, and it's difficult. I mean, with immigration, if you're not feeling passionate about it, you can't really effectively help. It is one of the lowest paying jobs for attorneys. <laughs> and a lot of attorneys are doing work uh, on a flat rate basis. It's not hourly for a lot of people that I know. So this is a plaza right across uh, the street from the federal building in Los Angeles where the court Immigration attorneys, whether defense or on the prosecution side, a lot of them come here and get coffee or I've seen them around. Yeah, everybody's in a rush because you, you have to get to court, then you have to go back to the office, you have to go back to the detention center, so everybody's in a rush, but we do usually see each other for two, three minutes that we have. <laughs> The odds of winning a case in immigration court with an attorney is 46%. Without an attorney, chances drop to just 10%. What are your chances of winning in court without an attorney? Very low. So basically, you have to have an attorney. You're not required to, but yes. Having an attorney can be a life or death issue for those fearing deportation to countries hostile to them. Reza Kavari fled from his home country of Afghanistan, claiming religious persecution, but was denied asylum, and now Natalie is helping him appeal his deportation. Right now, there are two cases pending, and I believe they're both very strong, but nobody can really guarantee the result. So right now, we're just waiting. It doesn't have any times. We never know how long it takes. It could take a few months, it could take years. So I wish some days something changed or something happened. It is hard. It is hard. But at least you're safe. You know, we, we try to be, um, we try to take some of the emotions out and try to be strictly focused on the cases, but some of the cases, even when you're done with them, you know, years later, you wonder, you know, what's happening with the person. And there are cases that I tried my 100% best, and the court gave a lot of chances, and still the person didn't follow through. Or sometimes it's just such a successful story that, well, I wonder if she graduated from her master's degree, or I wonder if she got out of that relationship that was bothering her, or, you know, just, just little things like that. Um, some of them you never forget. So yesterday, I went to Washington for court, uh, state of Washington, and um, it's, it's a little exhausting. And um, most people can't afford, you know, travel expenses, so half the time I'm not even charging them for travel expenses, I'm just basically charging them for the case. I don't know why I do it, but I, I love it. <laughs> 
This is a stressful period, I think, at least for me. A lot of the rules, um, the laws, the policies, the political aspect of things, they keep changing. People are just worried, you know, they, they call more often, they, you know, they, they hear something on the news or from their friends and say, oh, they're saying now that we can't file for this, or is this true, is this not? And there's a lot of information that may or may not be true. I've had times when I'm asleep and I just wake up in the middle of the night <laughs> thinking, should I file this motion? Why didn't I think about that? I mean, I don't even know how that works, but I wake up with that thought and I, you know, end up waking up and actually trying to do it. So it doesn't, it doesn't usually end once you leave the office, it's, it, it doesn't end. For some migrants, the uncertainty of being granted legal humanitarian entry into the U.S. isn't worth the risk. So they opt instead for a more expedient path by striking a deal with organized crime who control all means of crossing the U.S. border illegally. Soy una, una, una persona que le está introduciendo man, uh, gente ilegal. Entonces, para América, yo soy una persona peligrosa, aunque esté cometiendo algún delito. Pero, pues, es un trabajo también. Es un trabajo. This man, who goes by Alfredo, says he traffics people in this corridor controlled by the Sinaloa cartel, which was formerly headed by Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, a kingpin convicted in February 2019 in a U.S. court for drug trafficking, money laundering, and weapons charges. How do you know if there's border patrol around here? The people watching. They let me know. They call me and they let me know. So there's people watching us right now? Yes. He says that for nearly seven years, he's been smuggling people across this section of Mexico's border with Arizona. Migrants like this man, who agreed to show his face but refused to give his name. You see that the, the fence? The fence, the muro, ya está ya cerca. I can see the border fence. All across. Are you guys are you guys hopping over or are you gonna find a place where there is no fence? No, I, I, I will see. I have to go uh, tengo que llegar primero y ver como como uh -huh. está todo. Si es necesario brincar o buscar donde ya no haya defense. Mm -hmm. sí. Pero está okay. muy larga todavía la defense. Entonces es más probable que brinquemos. Okay. No. What's what's easier, the going over the fence or going all the way out to the for now, it's more easy. For, Jumping the fence is easier. Uh, now, yeah, because uh, it's too far. It's too far. We kept our distance from the border itself, but Alfredo said that rural areas like these are frequently used to get people into the U.S. illegally. Border smuggling is an organized and streamlined process that begins well in advance of the actual crossing here. <laughs> Another smuggler who works across various parts of Mexico told us he pays fees whenever he brings people through the cartel's turf and described the process. What do you charge for your services and where, uh, where do you pick up migrants and, and where do you drop them off? I go to the city of Tecunumán, Guatemala. I talk with them, I talk with the family via telephone. We get to the trade between 
4 y 5 mil dólares por ponerlos en la frontera de Tijuana. Tijuana, Estados Unidos, ¿no? Cada mes llevo entre 21. That's a lot of people. Mucha gente. Sí, pero el dinero no me queda solo a mí. Se va repartiendo. Somos, somos cinco o seis gentes que trabajamos. Y todos igual. The smugglers we spoke to say that just as in any trade, there's a cost of doing business. And as long as there's demand to move migrants across the border, they will figure out a way to meet it. If America builds a wall, will that change how much the cartel charges people to cross illegally? Pues sí. O sea, les va les va a costar más, pues. Porque si ahorita ah, les cuesta 5,000, 6,000 y si llegan a hacer eso, pues les va a costar o sea, 9,000, 8,000, depende lo, lo que es. Les, o sea, se les cobre por la misma manera de que ya no es, va a ser tan fácil. Entonces, se va a complicar más la situación en que la gente se quiera ir para Estados Unidos. Some fear that a price hike will only incentivize migrants looking to cross illegally to resort to committing additional crimes, like paying their way as drug mules. According to the DEA, agents are already starting to see a small rise in cases of migrants being enlisted to carry drugs like these across the border. Siempre va a haber una manera que el, que la gente que pueda cruzar para allá. O sea, de una manera u otra ellos tienen que la gente que trabaja en esto tiene que ver la manera de de pues de trabajar, de hacer su trabajo porque hay mucha gente pues que no sabe hacer otra cosa. United States, if you break the law, you go to jail and you're separated from your family. It shouldn't be any different for illegal immigrants. Throughout the corridor from South to North America, obstacles haven't appeared to impede this northward movement from dense jungles to shifting political winds and man-made physical barriers. We're going to be signing today and registering national emergency. And just as the migrants change course, so too will the people and the industries that have sprung up ready to adapt or thwart any attempts to stop them.